Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. And just as a side note, if there are any of you here that really aren't sure there is such a thing as eternity, <coughs> we had a six and a half hour delay at the Molokai Airport. <laughs> there is such a thing as eternity. <laughs> that was about as close as I ever want to get, I think. I'm not so sure. <laughs> and I don't think it was just that I took the mule ride on Friday, but when I came back and I was looking at the lessons today, they're just sort of a burr under my saddle. It may not be wrong, and I can't really say it shouldn't be, but as you hear those lessons read today, there's just something that sort of rubs. And it kind of rubs us raw. It starts with that Old Testament reading from Jonah. Jonah says, Nineveh, God says, Nineveh, go to Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrian Empire was particularly known for its cruelty in the Near East. Multiply the cruelty of what you see on ISIS by 10 and you get close to what the Assyrians would do when they conquered you. The Assyrian Empire has just conquered God's elected people, Israel. And in the process, they have probably done incredible, unspeakable cruelties to Jonah's family. And probably has killed many of them. <coughs> and now God goes to Jonah. And says, go to Nineveh, to those Assyrians who just did this to your family and your nation. And you tell them God is merciful and God loves them. And chapter 4, verse 1, it says, it was displeasing to Jonah. That's much stronger in the Hebrew. The Hebrew literally is, it is evil or bad. It left a bad taste in his mouth. That God would somehow forgive the people who did such an evil and make them equal to Jonah. And then you hear this parable about Jesus, the landowner. He hires people at 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock, noon, 3, and 5 in the afternoon. Or 5 in the afternoon. First off, you begin to realize, really, this whole parable, this is a very poor lawyer. Because all he had to do was have them sign a confidentiality agreement, and then no one could talk about who got paid what. Also, a really dumb pastor, because a pastor is smart enough, he would have brought the 6 a.m. people in and gotten them out of the church before the 5 p.m. people came in. But it also makes a lousy business person. Imagine what would happen to your company's productivity if you adopted the same policies as Jesus is professing in this parable. And somehow when you hear it, there's an unfairness in God's graciousness and His love. It's an assault on our senses of justice. If the sun shines on the just and the unjust, if the rain falls on the just and the unjust, here's the kicker. God loves your heathen neighbor just as much as you. And he's not doing a blooming thing today. He's not sitting in a hot church listening to a boring preacher. And all the while, you're here giving your tithe and giving your time. You drag your tired body out on a Sunday morning when the bed is so warm and nice. You work hard to give your tithe here and make your own and when you have your own needs to meet. And what value is there in trying to do all that if indeed God is going to love your heathen neighbor just as much as you and make them equal to you? Jesus tells this parable. He tells the parable after he's told his disciples that the kingdom of God is for sinners and tax collectors and little children. And the complaint of the Pharisees. It is said they looked at him with a apollomos poneros. Apollomos poneros. That is Greek for stink eye. <laughs> they looked at him with stink eye. And the reason they look at him with stink eye is you have made them equal to us. And then just before this parable, Peter turns to Jesus and asks, We have left everything to follow you. We shall receive, what shall we receive when you come into your kingdom? And it's a fair question. If they're only going to get what the sinners and cat collectors receive, why keep tramping around the countryside following this man when they have good businesses and families at home that need their own attending to? See, part of the problem is the motivation for work. The reason we end up working I hope you have joy in your work. But let's face it, when you're working, there are days you just don't want to go. So why do you go anyway? You work so somehow or another you can earn a paycheck, you can provide the necessities, 
and somehow or another you can get some kind of a future benefit, hopefully a pension health care plan, so when you can no longer work, you can still somehow meet your own needs. And if you don't have a job that provides benefits, you know how important they are. But that leads us to raise the question, what is the benefit package for living a life of faith? It's when we take this approach to our faith, everything gets all warped. And if you really ask the question, it is, faithing today, what is the reason why we're faithing today so we can receive some future benefit? It even sounds silly when you put it that way, but that's what we're asking of God. Why is the point in us being faithful if you're going to save my neighbor who isn't? I might as well go out, eat, drink, and be very like him. And just somehow... It is not a matter of getting paid dues to get into heaven. It's not a matter of somehow or another doing God's favor so our lives will get easier. And if that's why we end up doing them, God's loving graciousness is maddening. It's not fair and it rubs us raw. But when we didn't realize we don't live the faith for future benefits. And St. Paul put it so well in the second lesson. We live the faith simply for the sake of of living the faith. The faith is the reward. It's not a future benefit. It's not something that somehow compares or contrasts. It is simply the joy of being here together with God, with each other, and in His love and warmth and friendship. St. Paul put it, to live is Christ. He doesn't say to live for Christ or to live for something else. It is simply living is Christ. Living this moment, the loving, gracious presence of this God, already here in our midst, in bread and wine, that is the benefit. If we were going to rephrase this, I would end up going to God and say, God, I have to complain. For 61 years, I have lived in your indescribable love. I have known the joy of your grace. I have known forgiveness that will not end. 61 years I've lived that way, and my neighbor only one year. How silly is that? And God hears our complaining about it all the time. He says, how silly is that? I had a great New Testament prophet. He said, there are only two rules in the kingdom of God. The first rule is, God is gracious and loving. The second rule is, learn the... You guys are so smart. You must have had him too. He's a great prophet. Learn the first rule. You already have more of God's love than you can ever understand. You already have received more of God's forgiveness than you can ever absorb. You already have enough of God's strength so you can face any worldly challenge. You already have more of God's mercy than we will ever be able to deserve. You already have a joy in this God that our lives will always be full and rich. You already know a peace from this God, a peace that this world cannot take away. That's not a future benefit. It's not a Sunday religion. It's not a negotiation about pay scales and benefits. It is overflowing now in this place, and it invites you to live in Christ. We see this God every day. And in every place, and in every situation, and in every person, we see this God. Then we share that life with them. How could we ever be resentful? when we have received so much. Amen.